Okay, so today we're having a talk following up on Roy's talk from last week on uh, the postulates of quantum mechanics given by Dominic, who uh, has a master's in physics from the Colorado School of Mines. He also currently is employed by the Navy, specifically at the Panama City Naval Base uh, in, in the research division, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Take it away, Dominic. All right. Um... Can someone enable the screen sharing? Yeah, I just did. Go ahead. There's got to be a setting for that somewhere, which is just default. Not find it. Uh, come on, it's. I'm having some trouble getting it to come up. It's like wanting permissions and stuff. Uh, from Zoom or uh, something else? I'm not sure. Um, is it? The, the screen sharing works because uh, it popped yeah, up. Yeah, it might be some like security thing enabled on my computer. Uh, oh, are you using like a DoD laptop or something? No, it's mine, but Here, I'll, I'll pop. Okay, here you go. All right, can you all still see that? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna kind of finish up where, or pick up right where Roy left off uh, last week and uh, kind of talk about some other uh, general quantum concepts that I think would be good to mention and could be useful. So, um, so yeah, so we'll, I'm going to do a little more with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we'll kind of pick up like almost exactly where Roy left off and then kind of show how you get the specific uh, delta X, delta P uh, position momentum uncertainty from what Roy showed us last week. Um, he did a pretty good job with everything else, so there isn't really much left for me to cover with the other postulates. So I'll talk about some other uh, just quantum effects and uh, things like that. I'm gonna talk about like quantum measurements and observations and their uh, results of that, kind of talk a little bit about like wave function collapse and what that is and kind of give an example with wave particle duality, which is another kind of interesting quantum effect then we'll do a little bit about uh, super dense coding and then i'm just going to mention i'm not going to go into detail really at all i should maybe take this off here but um we'll talk about some other ways to frame uh quantum mechanics and some other uh formulations because i think there was sort of a question about time dependency last week so i thought i might mention that So, oops. I don't know what's going on. Oh, there we go, okay. So, I uh, wrote this out on paper because that was the best way for me to get this in, but um, so last week, I think Roy gave us this kind of general formalization of uncertainty principles where we've got delta a delta b is greater than or equal to one half of the magnitude of the expectation value of the commutator of a and b and so for quantum a lot we look at the position and momentum and those are um it's, uh, like a canonical uh relationship or commutation relationship um but so I'm just gonna plug X and P into what Roy gave us and kind of go through that and show what the final uh, uncertainty relationship is for X and P, your position and momentum. So just plugging straight in. Can you guys see my mouse? Yes. Okay, cool. So just plugging X and P into what Roy had, um, you get delta X delta P is greater than one half the commutator of X and P. 
Um, so we got to solve for the commutator of X and P. And we know that, well, X is just X, but then uh, your momentum is defined as uh, negative I H bar times uh, your first derivative in space or with respect to X. So uh, plugging that all in, or no, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna um, uh, apply this to some function, like a wave function or something, just a generic function to be able to actually go through and uh, actually be able to solve this all and actually apply this uh, operator to something. So we're just going to apply it to a generic psi of x. So then uh, with uh, your like uh, commutation properties, uh, you distribute that all through. So then you get uh, x times p times psi minus p times x times psi. But then we're going to plug in what uh, our p was. Uh, oops, sorry. So we'll plug in what our p was, which is that I, I hat in the first spatial derivative, and apply that to psi. And then uh, throw in the minus sign, to do this plug in uh, for p over there as well. And then what we'll end up with is this guy down here. And then you'll see that uh, once we distribute this uh, i hat through, because um, Right, because up here you had to use your uh, chain rule with your um, derivative since you've got x and psi of x. So then you end up with this guy and after you distribute the ih bar through, we'll see that uh, this term here with the ih bar x derivative of psi uh, will cancel out with the positive version of that over here. So then we're left with just I h bar psi is a result from the commutator of x and p on psi. So then since we know that, we can just uh, factor out that psi and then we get commutator of x and p is just I h bar. So then going back to this guy up there, we can just plug that all in and simplify. And I uh, we're taking the magnitude of that, so the imaginary portion doesn't really matter. So then we're just left with uh, delta x, delta p is greater than or equal to h bar over 2, which is the uncertainty relation for uh, position and momentum. And so I think that was about <laughs> all I had left for the postulates of quantum mechanics, because uh, Roy did a lot with that and covered pretty much everything else, so I just thought I'd go through that one specific example since that comes up so much. It's always wonderful to see concrete examples. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so then um, now I'm just going to kind of go over some just generic quantum effects and just some kind of quantum things I've picked up from taking a few classes on quantum that are kind of good to keep in mind, I think. And, uh, just because quantum systems behave a little differently than uh, classical systems. So we're going to look at, um, talk at uh, like measurements and observations kind of specifically here. Um, but uh, so in quantum objects can be in multiple states at once, kind of, and we call this a superposition of states. However, when you actually go to measure that, um, you will only ever find one outcome and we this is kind of uh it will destroy the superposition of states which uh physicists call the collapse of the wave function so we'll talk about that a little more often but that's kind of a term that uh, gets thrown around in physics um but so since there's a superposition of states and multiple uh states are present all at once before the measurement um uh you can't deterministically predict what your measurement outcome will be. So instead, the outcome is predicted uh, with probability. And we use the what we call the wave function psi 
which is uh, basically the complex root of the probability function that will uh, the prob of the probability function that will describe the probability of our uh, measured results. So when you take uh, the complex conjugate of psi, multiply it against itself, you'll get your probability. And uh, the psi is important there because that is that wave function is what is used in the Schrodinger equation, which governs all quantum behavior pretty much. So then I'm just going to kind of give some kind of rough sketch examples. So if you're looking at, say, like some particle in a box or something or some particle and where you might find it in space, um, you'll have some probability distribution. A lot of times it's a normal distribution or something like that, where you'll have a higher probability of finding it in the middle compared to the ends. Um, but so it's important to note that uh, just something else to prove, just something else to point out that the area under this uh, probability curve will all add up to one, even though like the probability of finding it here might only be like 20 or 30%. But if you add up the probability of finding it somewhere in space, um, you will get one because the particle exists. So you have to be able to find it somewhere in space. But so then, um, to show a plot of psi, which is kind of the root square root of what uh, we just I just showed with the probability. Um, it, a lot of times you'll see it looking kind of something like this, roughly, very roughly. My sketch is uh, not very good, but um, but so psi will contain uh, real and imaginary portions. So you'll just see the real portion plotted. But then um, the, since it's imaginary, um, you can also get uh, positive and negative values. So some of these can go uh, below the x axis. So then, um, but so then, oh yeah, so then I also just want to show what a wave function looks like. So I'm going to talk about wave function collapse. Because then after you measure about, um, some quantum system, and you get a definite state that you know what it is, um, the probability of it being in that state since you measured it and observed it is one. So you'll just have, you know exactly where it is with 100% probability. So you just have a line for the probability. And I'm not sure I've ever really seen anything like this graphed out, but I'm pretty sure this is what it's like uh, with your uh, wave function psi as well you know where it is. So it just goes to just a straight uh, vertical line. And so that's kind of why we call uh, when a, a uh, quantum system is measured and goes into one state, uh, that's why we call that um, wave function collapse because your wave function goes from something that's broad and spread out over X to something that's just you know where it is in one spot at X. But so since you are, are now have where it is now, you know that, but you lose all that other potential information on uh, where it can be at other states after you measure it or after you measure it. So measurements will kind of destroy your quantum state and you can't get any more info out of that quantum system now that you've measured it once. And so kind of an example of this that I kind of want to go through conceptually is the uh, is talking about a wave particle duality, specifically with a Young's double slit experiment. So uh, some of you may have seen this before. Um, basically, what you do is you take uh, a light source and shoot it at some uh, wall or paper or something with a couple of slits in it, then you'll look at the resulting pattern because normally for, uh, so they were doing this when they were trying to figure out, oops, sorry, um, they were doing this when they were trying to figure out if light was a particle or if, yeah, if light was a particle or a wave. So their idea with this was we'll shoot light at this double slit. And if it's a wave, 
um, it'll go through both at the same time and then it'll act as like a new point source. So then you have waves coming out from each and you'll get an uh, interference pattern on the wall after. But if it's uh, just particles, then there should only be on this uh, wall back there, there should only be uh, like two spots where the light is hitting. So what they, um, so they did that and um, they kind of saw a mix of both results. So they saw um, they saw inter they saw an interference pattern, but um, to eliminate the fact that it could potentially be uh, multiple photons going through at the same time and interfering with each other, what they did is they uh, managed to send they managed to find a way to send single photons through. So only one photon would go through at a time, and so that's what all these little dots are. These are um, uh, individual photons and where they hit on the wall after. So once you send through uh, enough photons, um, you start to see this interference pattern build up, even though you were only sending one photon through at a time. Like So for one photon, you don't see an interference pattern. You just see the dot from where it hit. So that shows us that um, each photon, well, it, it behaves as a wave and a particle. So as it's going through before you measure it and observe it, um, it behaves as a wave. And we can know that because um, even because we see an interference pattern, but we only see part of it at once because we sent one photon through at a time. But given the fact that no photons were hitting in these, this isn't a perfect picture, but um, that fewer photons were hitting in the dark spots. Um, we know that they were interfering with themselves. So um, and going back to like uh, wave function collapse, we say that like um, before we measured or observed the light with like the detector, or the screen, um, it's in a superposition of states and behaves like a wave and can be in multiple spots at once, which is how it interferes with itself. But once you observe it with this screen, you collapse wave function so it's in a localized position so you only see like one dot per photon at a time on the screen so then it take but then once you do that enough and the photons hit in different random spots so you can build up the interference pattern to see that yes they do also behave like waves and so um almost the an identical thing but it's kind of cool is they've also done this with electrons. So what we typically think of as particles, not waves. Um, they found that it goes both ways from like light waves behaving like uh, particles too, but also particles behaving like waves. So they've seen interference patterns with electrons, which is kind of cool. And so then, um, now we're going to get back to more of the quantum computing side of things and uh, look at that last little section on a uh, super dense coding. So uh, the super dense coding makes it possible to send two classical bits of information with the sender only interacting with and sending uh, one of the qubits. And the second bit of classical information is provided from the effects of quantum quantum entanglement that the uh, receiver will have that second entangled particle. So the procedure for this is uh, you've got like two parties, Alice and Bob, it's the two parties that almost every textbook uses. Um, so they will each have one of two pre-entangled qubits and just say we put it in uh, this initial state here, which is uh, one of the Bell states which is an entangled states. So then it's pre-entangled, Alice gets one, uh, Bob gets one. Then, so for Alice to send two bits of information to Bob, she will manipulate her qubit in some way and then send her qubit onto, onto Bob. So then Bob will have both qubits that are entangled. 
And uh, since the particles are entangled, whenever Alice manipulates or changes her qubit somehow, Bob's qubit will also get changed somehow. And then uh, the final state of the total system of both entangled qubits will convey the two classical bits of information once the total state of both entangled particles is measured. And so the way they, um, there's uh, four ways that Alice can uh, manipulate her qubit. So if Alice does nothing to her qubit, then the state will be unchanged and we'll call that uh, state zero, zero. And that's just gonna be the initial bell state. It was in the zero, zero plus one, one. Then for the classical zero, one state, um, Alice can apply the Z gate to her qubit, then the entangled uh, state, quantum state will become the zero, zero minus one, one over root two bell state. Then for the one, zero classical state, Alice can apply the X gate to her qubit and the entangled state is then uh, the one, zero plus zero, one over root two bell state. And finally, for the one one state, uh, classically, Alice will apply the I Y gate to her qubit to change the to change the entangled state into the zero one minus one zero over root two Bell state. And so, um, these four, each of these four uh, quantum states for the entangled system is. Uh, one of the bell states and the bell states form an orthonormal basis. And so since Alice sent her qubit to Bob, Bob has all the components of the entangled state. So he can perform a measurement on the whole system in the bell basis, basis, AC. He can perform a whole measurement. And then, so that measurement will yield one of the four bell states which uh, was pre-assigned to correspond to a classical, uh, classical state with two bits of information. Uh, yeah, so that's about all I've got on the stuff that was in the book. But then um, I was watching the video for last week's lecture or talk and um, remembered seeing something there was a little bit of a question on like time dependency stuff that came up so i don't know how related this is or if this ever comes up in quantum computing but um there are a few other ways to formulate quantum mechanics there's a few different ways to formulate quantum mechanics that uh kind of handle the time dependency in different ways so the first is the schrodinger picture which is kind of the normal uh, Schrodinger equation, what most people are used to seeing, where like your operators, like your Hamiltonian and everything, those are all constant in time. Then the, I guess the Schrodinger equation will change the basis of the state space in time. So like uh, all your size will be psi of t. But then uh, there's, uh, I guess, so Heisenberg came up with something else smart and uh, came up with the Heisenberg picture where the time dependency is shifted from the wave function instead um, to the operator. So like all your Hamiltonians will ha have the time dependency built into them. While like your psi will be like uh, your psi at your initial time and then won't change in that psi won't change in time. The time dependency will be uh, handled through the operators. And then the last one is the Dirac and or interaction picture. In that, both the operators and the bases change in time. So your Hamiltonian and like your wave function will both have time dependencies in them. I guess that kind of leads towards quantum field theory, which I think is way beyond this. And I got lost there, so I'm not gonna try to talk about that. <laughs> QFT was... It was something. <laughs> it's fun. Highly recommend taking like an intro course on it for funsies, but um, 
not relevant to quantum computing as far as I'm aware. <laughs> that is good to know. Right? <laughs> Very much in that class. <laughs> Um, was there were there questions? Questions. Okay. So Lisa had a question in the chat. Um, well, first, let me clap. Yeah, clap. Yay. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Well-known fact: physicists can't draw well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a question. It's um, just a weird aside. That one has got to catch up, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So Elisa's question: so basically, the photon behaves like a wave before uh, observed, observed by the screen, and then behaves like a particle when observed. Yes. So um, the a uh, photon will be kind of in a superposition of states, kind of where it's like a wave and can be at multiple uh, places in space at the same time. Um, but then the act of you actually measuring and observing it causes the wave function to collapse when you get a photon at a single point in space. So the act of observing or measuring the particle or the photon or whatever quantum system you're looking at it, when you observe it, you will kind of destroy the superposition of states. So then um, you only, so you get a value, but then you lose all the other potential information that is stored there. So, yeah, so um, with quantum systems, like how you observe them, plays a pretty big role because that can fundamentally change what is happening in the system. Does that kind of answer your question? It looks like it, yeah. Um, let's see. Whether or not yeah. do you do observe. Marguerite has an interesting point. Um, yeah, so uh, Elisa's question is one part is like uh, the difference between before and after measurement uh, the wave particle nature, but uh, it, it's very interesting, I think, to discuss whether or not it matters that you look. Um, so, for example, I wish Mary, Mary Catherine was uh, trapped in the meeting, but uh, you could you could differentiate the slits, right? You could put like a vertical polarizer and a horizontal polarizer um, in front of the slits and and never check what the polarization of the photons are. And doesn't that affect the young double slit experiment results? Do you know anything about that? I... Hmm. Trying to think through. I think it would affect it some, although it might depend on. I guess I'm trying to think. There could be a couple of different setups. So, say you've got, you put like a horizontal and vertical polarizer in there. Um, yeah, like, like you differentiate the slits. Like one of them now has a vertical polarizer on it, and the other one has a horizontal polarizer. Yeah. You're still doing the same experiment, you're not checking polarization. Do you still get a wave-like interference when you send through multiple photons? Um, I th that's what I'm trying to think. If so, I think if you're using an unpolarized source of light, um, that the polarization might be random enough that you would still get. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if polarization is end of, is uh, dependent on position. Like, yeah, well, not. So. Um, but it tells you it labels which slit it goes through. Even oh, if you it? don't check, it labels what slit. So you uh, could check. Okay. But so, you so don't. The, the more general question is uh, if you have a device on, on the, the slits, which will detect which slit the, uh, let's say, photon went through, then does it affect the experiment? And the answer is uh, yes. I okay. think, yeah. I'm just trying to think if you were to have like a purely like unpolarized source of light, you would still get some. 
uh, like photons that would be like kind of in between polarization. Some would have polarization components. But a superposition of polarization. You might still get some interference there and you might still see a bit of a wave behavior and an interference pattern. But then that would still be, I guess it could still potentially kind of go through both if it's got components, uh, polarization components in uh, both the vertical and horizontal direction. But if you use like a polarized source of light, then that would block all the light going through one of the slits. So then you wouldn't see any interference pattern. Yeah, so I think the general point is if you detect uh, which slit the photon goes through, then the wave-like properties of the photon just disappear. And this thing basically just becomes a particle, right? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh, so Marguerite's point, though, was uh, what if you put in somehow the ability to uh, to check which slip the photon goes through, but don't actually check. You just have the ability to do it. Yeah. Then, then does it does it still behave like a particle or does it still have wave like properties? That... I think it would actually depend on if you check or not. Does it? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so this is the point of the eraser experiment. Um, yeah, I'm trying to facilitate discussion like I have, <laughs> but it's the, that's the quantum eraser. Um, and I think now I would not know if the one who actually did this, but I think it matters if you yeah. can check, regardless of whether or not you do. Yeah, I think if you have the ability to check, then it collapses into a particle. Um, that's also a good question. Um, are polarizers considered manipulators or measurement? Yeah, like, um, yeah, like quantum gates manipulate quantum states, but don't mess with the properties. Um, yeah, so, I, I think, I think if you were to like <laughs> just let the particle or just let the photons go through and they go through whatever um, slit and polarizer they go through. I think you might still see a wave function or an interference pattern, see wave behavior. But um, if you actually, to be able to check which uh, polarizer they went through, you have to have some like way of like having a detector or something at the polarizer, which I think would collapse the wave function. And then you would just get a particle there. So then you would lose the wave behavior there when you actually try to detect it at the at the polarizer. Uh, as far as it being a manipulator or or a measurement, uh, I would say it's probably considered more a measurement because it's it's not linear, right? The polarizer collapses the superposition into uh, either up or down or, or whatever. Yeah, no, direction it projects it onto its polarization, so that yeah. makes it sound like a measurement, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and it's not unitary. Yeah, it's definitely not unitary. Like if you have a superposition of two polarizations and you project down to one, you can't go backwards, right? It, 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 mm -hmm. You don't know what superposition you are in to go backwards into, but. Uh, and you lose light going through, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you're like one polarizer, you for an unpolarized source, you lose half your light. Yeah, so it's definitely not a unitary operator like you would see in quantum computing. Uh, so I guess maybe it is a measurement. Yeah. I never thought about that. I know I've never really thought about this. So, um, so the super dense coding part—that's that's the interesting topic of the day, I think. Uh, so the whole point of it is you have Alice and Bob, and they prepare a entangled state right in the beginning, right? So Alice takes one copy, Bob takes the other copy and they go on their merry way. You know, Alice flies to the Andromeda galaxy and Bob stays on earth. And, <laughs> and uh, Alice wants to send two bits of information to Bob and her life depends on it. And uh, all she has is this one qubit and she wants to know, can I send th these two bits to, to Bob? The answer is yes. And the way you do it is with the algorithm that Dominic described today, which is really interesting. 
So you have uh, an entangled bit or entangled pair, and uh, that allows you to transmit two bits of information just by sending one qubit. Really neat. Uh, I don't know. Are there any questions about the super dense coding part? Eliza asked, uh, what do you mean by basis? Basis of what exactly? Oh, I think that was for something earlier. Uh, no, it was off of it was off of, off of what? That was the extra part. Yeah, that was just like the basis of the Hilbert space for the state space that um, happened to be working in. Yeah, yeah but you have just whatever you end up in. I always, there, there's something about super dense coding that is strange to me, which is that it's, I, I mean, I guess if you can do a bell measurement and instantly know which of the four states you're in. But um, before this, naively, I was thinking, wouldn't you need to send multiple qubits anyway to build up statistics of what state you're in? But they should always perfectly one of the bell states. So. Yeah, if you're always per perfectly in one of the bell states, then uh, if you make a bell measurement, then it, you'll collapse to one of the states. It just seems like it would work very poorly with error. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea I got from the book was, I think it mentioned that they, like all the, or that like, I think it was because the bell states are all orthonormal. Like yeah. it should be pretty obvious which one you're measuring. Yes, yeah, exactly. So it's not like there's some kind of, uh, there shouldn't be too much crossover was the idea I got. Yeah, so you have these four projectors onto the different uh, vectors in the basis. And when you project with each projector, the answer is either one, zero, zero, or zero. And if it's a one, you know which one you got. Uh, let's see. So next week, I think Roy is doing, uh, here, let me stop the recording. This is irrelevant.